Uh, my name is Bob Kingston, and I'm Portland Opera's resident historian and lecturer. Before I get started today, just a couple of quick reminders. After the show today, down on the main floor, I have an opportunity to attend the back talk with Portland Opera's general director, Christopher Mataliano. This will be a great chance for you to ask questions because this is Chris's production. Um, so uh, definitely plan on sticking around for that. Also, next Friday at 7 o'clock at the Sherman Clay in the Pearl District is the last of this season's installment of Destination Opera. Uh, Alexis Hamilton, Portland Opera's Manager of Education and Outreach, and Ralph Beaumont from the Oregon Psychoanalytic Institute will be on hand to talk about the multiple layers of meaning in these two operas. And there are lots of layers of meaning. And that's actually what really drew Ravel to both of these stories. But I'll get to that in just a second. So if I mentioned the name Maurice Ravel to most people, the very first thing that would come to mind would be Bolero. Uh, <laughs> which, you know, actually, I, I've, I've kind of come to terms with Bolero after all these years. It's actually not a bad piece. Um, it sort of suffers from overexposure, but, you know, it, it really is a very good piece. Um, if you're familiar at all with Ravel beyond that, you might know one of his ballets like Mother Goose or Daphnis and Chloe. Uh, maybe you've had an opportunity to hear some of his piano music and recital or maybe even some of his songs. But for most of us, it's that one single piece that kind of comes to define Ravel. Um, the interesting thing about Bolero is that in some ways it really tells us nothing about Ravel's music. It does give us a clue to one aspect of his compositional style, which is his fascination with music of Spain. And we hear that in the first opera today, Le Espanol, The Spanish Hour. Ravel's background on his mother's side was Basque. And he always uh, expressed an interest in Spanish folk music but not from any kind of ethnomusicological uh, sense. Uh, for them, Spain was kind of the other. It was some distant place, even though it's right next door, but the culture was foreign enough for most of them. So when we hear pieces like Bolero or Le Espanol, what we're hearing is Spain filtered through French sensibilities. Ravel even said about this opera that it's a vision of Spain as seen from the heights of Montmartre. So it's definitely not an attempt to evoke Spain in any real uh, kind of ethnographic sense. Ravel did, however, incorporate Spanish music into Le Espanol. We'll hear an example of a jota, we'll hear a malagueña, and at the very end of the opera, the one moment where all five characters come together to sing uh, in the final ensemble, a wonderful habanera. Now, the story of Le Espanol is pretty straightforward. It's a kind of a bedroom farce. It, it's kind of like uh, noises off. You know, lots of people running in and out, hiding in things, barely missing each other. Uh, it premiered in Paris in 1904 as a play by um, a reasonably successful playwright named Maurice Legrand. It was actually the opener for a larger play that he wrote called La Deserteuse, which also dealt with the subject of marital infidelity. When uh, Le premiered, it was a scandal. It rocked everyone's sensibilities because it, in a sense, sanctioned something that society felt was not sanctionable, and that is marital infidelity. So the story, we have uh, a clockmaker in Toledo named Torquemada. And once a week, he goes out and sets all of the clocks, Thursday afternoon between 2 and 3. Conveniently, his wife, who is named Concepcion, I love that name, <laughs> uses that hour period to receive her lovers. And on this particular day, well, let's just say things don't go as planned. Her uh, rendezvous is disrupted by a rather simple-minded muleteer named Ramiro, who comes into the shop 
to have Torquemada look at his clock, his watch, which has stopped running. As they say, hilarity ensues. <laughs> and uh, we get to the end of the story. There's a wonderful moral from Boccaccio, uh, where the characters say that um, in matters of love, it's the most effective who uh, gets the job done. And uh, even the muleteer gets his day. <laughs> it's sort of like every dog gets his day, every muleteer gets his day. One thing that attracted Ravel to this story was uh, he wanted to recreate comic opera. He pointed out in an interview that there really was no tradition of writing comic opera in France. And he wanted to try to establish that tradition. The play struck him as being very funny. But what he wanted to do was move beyond just setting a funny play and actually try to write music that was funny. And I want to play one example. This is uh, the very beginning of the opera. This is shortly after Ramiro comes into Torquemada's uh, clock shop to uh, have Torquemada look at his watch. And Ramiro explains that this is a family heirloom. And I'll read to you the text. He says, it served my uncle the Toreador from the horns of death. In the Barcelona bull ring, when the bull plunged, this watch in his waistcoat pocket saved him from being gored. But then the watch stopped the brute. Now the watch itself has stopped. <laughs> so I want to play a little bit of this music. And this is a great example of uh, not only Ravel's ability to evoke humor in music, but also just Ravel's genius as a composer. Now, what you'll hear in this recording is a version uh, that's quite different from what you'll hear today as far as the performing forces, and I'll talk about that when this is done. So that big glissando and thump there was meant to evoke the bull goring uh, the toreador. Uh, and then he ends up by saying, well, of course, now the watch has stopped. Um, what you're going to hear today.